everybody and welcome to the Eileen Skellen Awards 2020 in this the year of the nurse and the midwife. It's been an unexpected and unusual year. Um, instead of being all together as we'd really prefer, uh, we'll be delivering um, this content for you online tonight. And I hope that means that more people will be able to join in and watch actually. So you're probably used to seeing Vanessa and, and I from um, MHTV. We're usually with you on a Thursday night. Um, but tonight, obviously, it's a special occasion. Um, it'll be a, a really um, celebratory night. And we'll be starting off with Dave Monday, who will be giving um, an introduction to Eileen Skellen. And I was also saying um, it's really important that we remember the practitioners who've gone before us so that we can see the best of us. You know, we look back at maybe some of the, the things that have come before us in mental health, you know, asylums and, and other issues like that that haven't necessarily been positive. But we've always had really amazing role models, practitioners who've taken us forward. And I think it's really important that we, we know who they are and we celebrate them. After that, uh, Professor Mick McEwen will be um, introducing us to the Skellen Lecturer for 2020, and that's Dr. Russell Ashmore. Um, he'll be talking on the fall of Icarus, the trials and tribulations of the informal patient in the 21st century. After that, uh, Professor Patrick Callahan will be introducing us to the Journal of Psychiatric and Mental Health Nursing Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, and the winner of this year of the um, Lifetime Achievement Award is Professor Amir Muir Cochrane. And she'll be um, basically giving you an acceptance speech and then we're presenting the award. Uh, after that, we'll come back to us and we'll wish you good night. So handing over now to Vanessa, who will be telling you a little bit about how you can participate tonight. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Nikki. It's, um, it's great to have you all with us. I think it's brilliant um, in a way that we're able to um, to bring this to you all. As Nikki says, it's a shame that it's not in person, but hopefully um, little advantage and that anyone can join in tonight. So tonight's going to be slightly different to our usual MHTV social media. Tonight, what we're asking you to do is either um, join us via Facebook or Twitter or both, if you can manage that, to join in on, um, on Twitter you just need to um, use a Skellen 2020 hashtag. You'll be able to see any other comments that people have put in there. Any comments about, about the programme as we're going along, if you'd like to share your thoughts on there. Unfortunately, tonight we won't be doing what we usually do, which is feeding through any questions um, to the programme. We're not able to do that because tonight's in a lecture. But we'd love it if you could all have conversations about it. We'd also love it because this is about being social. If you could post any photographs of yourself, um, maybe tell us a little bit about where you're watching the Skellen Lecture. Great to make it a celebration of mental health. Um, as Nikki says, Dave's going to be talking a little bit in a minute about the background to Skellen. Um, I have to say, I wasn't fully aware of um, Eileen Skellen's background. Didn't realise that she started in Leeds, where, where I started my work. And I think, like Nikki says, really important that we understand the history of mental health if we're to look forward to the future and where we're going mm -hmm. and the past. And I have to say, brilliant that Skellen was a woman as well, because a lot of um, historical figures in mental health tend to be men, and the history of mental health tends to be associated with men as well. So I'll share that. Um, now, back to social media, if you're following on Facebook, just the usual um, way of engaging. So if you go over to Facebook and you like the Unite MHNA Facebook page, the live feed should automatically appear on there. Um, as I've said with Twitter, unfortunately, we can't feed any comments into the show tonight. However, if you want to have conversations and um, leave any messages for people tonight, that would be great. And we look forward to, um, to you joining us. Thank you. Absolutely. Good evening, colleagues. I wanted to extend my welcome and that of Unite the Union and the Mental Health Nurses Association to the 2020 Skellen Lecture and Journal of Psychiatric and Mental Health Nursing Lifetime Achievement Award evening. Whilst we're so sad that we can't attend this year's event in person and enjoy Middlesex University hospitality, we are really glad to be hosting the event online through our MHTV partnership with We Mental Health Nurses, the Centre for Co-Production in Mental Health and Social Care, and Mental Health Nurse Academics UK. I hope that whilst I'll be working behind the scenes with excellent colleagues Nikki Lambert and Vanessa Garrity tonight, 
you'll be at home relaxing with a suitable beverage and enjoying the proceedings in a slightly different way to usual. 2020 has been a difficult year for so many people, but we're so very grateful for the work of the mental health nurse community. And it's filled us with pride to bring this community together through work, including MHTV, the recent International Mental Health Nurse Research Conference, and tonight. For those unaware of Eileen Skellen and her legacy, we wanted to provide a quick snippet of information, including to the genesis of tonight's lecture and award. I'd encourage you to spend a little time on the awards website so you can learn much more. Congratulations to both Russell and Ema as they join an auspicious club. Please take a few minutes to celebrate their achievements and that of mental health nursing on Twitter by using the hashtag Skellen2020. Eileen Skellen was an English psychiatric nurse who was involved in pioneering psychosocial and psychotherapeutic methods for treating patients. She helped open up new roles for nurses in mental health work and demonstrated that they could be equal partners in a team, taking personal responsibility for patient care while collaborating with doctors and playing an important part in new developments in therapeutic treatment. While also taking a lead in education, administration and policy development, she did research and published in medical and nursing journals and was a member of key committees in her field. The Skellen Lecture was established in 1980 in order to remember the significant contribution of Eileen. One of her last contributions was the planning of the first International Psychiatric Nursing Congress in 1980, but sadly Skellen passed away shortly before the conference. The inaugural Skellen Lecture was delivered two years later by Baroness Macfarlane, and then over the following years the Skellen Lecture was held biannually, attracting a roster of leading nurses, you can see this roll call on the Skellen website. In 2006, the Skellen Lecture Series was revitalised as an annual event and in collaboration with the Journal of Psychiatric and Mental Health, a new Lifetime Achievement Award was introduced with the aim of celebrating a sustained career contribution in the field of mental health. In 2006, the Skellen Lecture Series was revitalised as an annual event and in collaboration with the Journal of Psychiatric and Mental Health, a new Lifetime Achievement Award was introduced with the aim of celebrating a sustained career contribution in the field of mental health. For the 2006 event, a new appointments panel was gathered together consisting of previous lecturers and sponsoring organisations. This panel has steadily grown in size and you can see its current membership on the Skellen website. The panel is now supported by the Skellen Lecture Trust, which is held by the Institute of Mental Health in Nottingham. Each year the panel receives nominations for both the Skellen Lectureship and the JPMHN Lifetime Achievement Award. The Skellen Lecture nominations are not limited to only mental health nurses, and in the past there have been people beyond the field of mental health nursing who have been nominated, but on each occasion it has been a mental health nurse who has been appointed. Shortlisted candidates for the Skellen Lecture are asked to present a title and synopsis and lifetime candidates a short biography. The panel then votes on their preferences for each award. The ongoing standing of the JPMHN Lifetime Achievement Award and the Skellen Lecture is thanks to the ongoing support of event sponsors and supporters, the willingness of colleagues to have their names to go forward to the shortlist and the efforts of organisational teams that host the evening. Hi, it really is a great pleasure for me to be able to introduce this year's Eileen Skellen Laureate, Russell Ashmore. Having had the honour of giving last year's lecture, I personally know how pleased and humbled Russell must be feeling to have been afforded this recognition by a very select electorate of previous winners who we can now justly consider his peers. As you can imagine, I've been scurrying around looking for anecdotes and scurrilous stories to embarrass Russell with. And I have to say how disappointed I am to have found no scandal, only affectionate and positive testimonials. In doing this, I confirm some of my own positive views of Russell, and also had my eyes open to aspects of his life and career that I didn't previously know. I like to think that Russell and myself, and many of you in the audience, share a lot in common. 
I'm also tickled by the fact that this fact-finding expedition wasn't completely wasted and we found out some gossip about Mark and Dad and more of that later. Russell's daughters, Kate and Caroline, are hopefully joining us online. But sadly, Russell's mum died a year ago. They were very close and great friends and I'm sure if she'd have been able to be here, she would be very proud of Russell for this honour. So, Russell is known to us as a powerful advocate for a more humane and democratic psychiatry. He's also the unofficial historian and archivist of the International Mental Health Nursing Conference, formerly and perhaps better known as MPNR, and one of the few people to be in all iterations of this important marker of our professional esteem since its inception in 1996. I even believe he met his partner Elizabeth, another of our esteemed colleagues, at the 2000 conference. And throughout these years, Russell has offered a series of talks at the conference which illuminate mental health nursing's checkered relationship to compulsion and coercion as legitimated by sections of the Mental Health Act. Right now, he's immersed in Sheffield archives and has developed a database of the admission records of nearly 17,000 people admitted to the asylums of Sheffield. So Russell was involved in the MPNR conference at every step along the way. And now to the Mark Haddad story. He once chaired a session where Mark was presenting. With a strong suspicion of a rather late and drink fueled night before, Russell was actually quite surprised that Mark made it on time for a 9am paper. And as they were waiting for the conference room to fill up, Mark said to Russell, is there a rubbish bin? Russell showed him one and Mark littered it up below the table and immediately threw up in it. To, to his credit, he then went on to present a flawless paper without any sign that he was, in fact, probably still drunk. And I think many of us might share aspects of that story or even have been there on the day. So listening to Russell's recent talk on Mental Health TV about the legacy of this conference, and I'm turning to the serious side of it now, maybe it's about time we made his historian title official. He's absolutely right when he says that understanding our collective history is very much an art of analysing the present to be able to imagine better futures. Or, to borrow from my second favourite German philosopher, that's after Klopp, a profession that fails to learn from history risks repeating mistakes. First as farce, second as tragedy. Of course, being inclined to sort of archival work, to collect, keep in order, catalogue, reread, and reflect upon the documents and minutiae of historical record is the act of an obsessive and I hope Russell won't mind if we consider him the very best of obsessives. Indeed, he's our obsessive, a perfectionist for our profession. And for me, he is in very fine company, as no introductory speech of mine would be worth its salt without mentioning over and over, in kindred spirit, other important historical obsessives, that's Liverpool football club managers. Starting with Bill Shankly, that most famous of obsessives, so Shankly's own obsessions, if you're interested in reading about them, are detailed, again in obsessive fashion, by the great Yorkshire writer David Peace in his brilliant book, Red or Dead. And the title of that book, the red in the title, is purposely ambiguous, which in turn brings me neatly back to another of Russell's positive character traits, his commitment to socialist values that are grounded in an upbringing he somewhat shared with Shanks. So both Russell's granddads were miners in Derbyshire, and of course, Shankly's were, you know, um, my, you know, Shankly's whole family were miners in Scotland. And Russell grew up in a council estate and experienced stigma receiving free school meals. He comes from small town Chesterfield and was expected to go and work in a factory like all his family, but that wasn't for Russell. Becoming a scholar, however, some of his family and his mum even seemed a little in awe of this. Though he easily transitioned on occasion when he needed to, to a broad Chesterfield accent and would match his family drink for drink when they were together. Perhaps because of this solid working class upbringing, Russell has always been something of a class warrior. He's anti-authoritarian, anti-royalist and immensely proud of his own class heritage. In his early days, really commendably, Russell exhibited the sort of maverick recalcitrant professionalism that I applauded in my own scanning lecture. And early on, he refused to wear a uniform, which is to his great credit, I think. Related to this, neither Russell or his mum suffered fools gladly. Or maybe I should say that Russell does indeed suffer very much when he's in the company of ignorance. 
And I suppose like many of that generation of mental health nurse academics whose careers coincided with the shift of nurse training into the academy, Russell's journey to being a researcher and lecturer was not founded on a traditional route into university employment and many class hurdles had to be overcome. And back to football for a minute, but importantly, I found out that when Russell worked as a CPM, specialising in PTSD, he worked with people caught up in the Hillsborough disaster. And for this, he has my heartfelt personal gratitude. And it's it's another great reason amongst many to buy him a pint. But Russell, you'll have to wait tonight because it's all online. Unless you want my favourite beer, which is which is virtual beer, and, and have one on me. So returning to the serious business of the evening, it turns out that Russell has more in common with Eileen Skellen than he might have imagined, or even than he alluded to in his recent TV turn. He didn't work in a therapeutic community like Eileen, but he did have the fortune to work with the much-missed Alec Jenner in the 1980s on awards where they tried to introduce principles of the Trieste model. Of course, Alec, amongst other things, was instrumental in bringing democratic psychiatry ideas across from Italy to this country, and Yorkshire in particular, and he helped also helped found the Fantastic Asylum magazine. And in all these endeavours, in all these endeavours, I think I can see Russell's hand as well. So Russell has been in nurse education absolutely forever, and he previously trained at Middlewood Mental Hospital in Sheffield. He did a master's degree in communication studies at the same time as he was doing his nurse training. And I have it on good authority from Elizabeth that this made him unpopular because he was apparently, I quote, an arrogant git and he knew a lot more than some of his nurse tutors. To be fair though, Russell has a great depth of knowledge and his mind is full of classic theories and historical details that he can pull out when needed, including, as we're about to hear tonight, knowledge of Greek myths. His nan bought him a book about Icarus when he was nine, and he still has it. And he says that Stephen Fry's recent book on Greek mythology is, well, rubbish. So I'm looking forward to a great and informative talk in Russell's inimitable laid-back style. As I hand him over to you, I want to remind us of the words of Antonio Gramsci's trial judge, who on sentencing Gramsci for his own revolutionary activities, remarked that the sentence passed would amount to exiling his brain for 20 years. I think Russell's career analysing the legal disposal of the mad and mentally distressed recalls other ways in which people with, given the chance, something really valuable to say and teach us about the human condition can be removed and separated from ordinary life and thus effectively silenced. The work of people like Russell shines a light into these corners and assists all of us in our emancipation from an overarching hegemony, hegemony that Gramsci eloquently theorised. Of course, despite all the relevant intersections of interests, Gramsci was clear about the centrality of class to both oppression and resistance. And I think in Russell, Gramsci would recognise a truly organic intellectual with a heartening optimism of the spirit. Now, let's enjoy his talk. Russell Ashmore, the 2020 Island Skeleton Lecture. Well, here we are, Scallon 2020. Um, I'm going to take a gamble, as this is a pre-recorded lecture, and thank Mick for his kind words of introduction. Before I start the lecture, I just want to say, uh, well, some thank yous and note some people. Firstly, um, Bridget Hamilton and Ellie Walsh, who were the other nominees for this year's lecture. And I would recommend that, any, that you have a look at their abstracts on the scan site. My partner Elizabeth Collier for enduring support and also during the last year for her ability to feign interest in every obscure piece of mental health legislation from the 1800s that for some inexplicable explicable reason I've managed to get excited about. A hello to my daughters Kate and Caroline who obviously couldn't find anything better to watch on Netflix tonight so a tuning in to this one. Um, my mother, who sadly died last October, shortly after the announcement for this lecture, and can't be with us. My mental health colleagues at, at SHU, 
Sheffield Hamlin University for putting up with me going on about this lecture for the last year and finally to the appointment committee for voting me for me to say the least and I know everybody says it each year but it, it is a genuine honour to be here tonight and when you look at who's delivered this lecture before it's seriously daunting I personally have never had any connections with Eileen Skellum but I had a quick look at her biography before recording this lecture and I did notice as part of her career she had been involved in investigating malpractice and the abuse of patients right and I think they're themes that resonate with some of the issues I've, I've got to say tonight why why have I chosen this topic well as some of you will know I've had an interest in mental health legislation and mental health nursing for some some time now but more recently that interest has focused on informal admissions and it appears to me that in recent reports so for example the, the recent independent review of the mental health act chaired by simon wesley literature historical texts and, and policy documents that the informal patient has on has on the, on the whole become a ignored area so in tonight's lecture one of my aims is to give voice to this group of people and in doing that, I want to comment on the reported decline of informal admission. And the big part of it, though, is to look at the history of how informal admission evolved, how it rose and potentially how it's fallen as well. Obviously, in that, that, that history has been over 200 years in the making. And I won't be able to go through all of that even though I'll put more of a bit more of it up on the screen than I'll actually talk about so I'm going to pick out some of what I think are the highlights and low lights and having done that I then want to go on and finish by offering some commentary on aspects of informal admission in 2020 the repercussions the outcomes of this history and just to make it clear from the start, by informal admission, and that's the phrase I'm using, info and informal patient, these are people who've come into hospital who are not detained under the Mental Health Act. And I would add to that, that admission should be voluntary and based on informed consent. Thirteen months ago now, I received an email from Gary Winship informing me that I'd been nominated for this lecture and, lecture. and it included the line, as you know, the unexpected and ambitious tends to be well favoured. In accepting that nomination, I knew that I had to come up with some attention grabbing title. And I thought at the time it really wouldn't matter what I came up with because I probably wouldn't be giving the lecture. But in thinking about it, and as someone who's been interested in Greek mythology since I was nine and I was given this book by my grandmother, I've always had an interest. And so it's no surprise to me that the title came out of that. And it's no surprise, even though the idea, the reason why was not fully formed at the time, that I decided in, on the Icarus title. Now, Icarus... The myth of Icarus, and uh, to, to put it correctly, it's actually the myth of Icarus and his father, Daedalus. It's existed for thousands of years, so in the work of Siculus and, and Virgil. But the version that I've focused on in preparing for this lecture is that that appears in um, Ovid's Metamorphoses. And I must admit... Um, going back to the title, having given or, or yes, having, having received the nomination for the lecture, I have been wondering for the last few months um, whether my perhaps rash and grandiose title is me has meant, yeah, what, what it's meant. Hopefully, I can try and convince you that I have given it some consideration. 
So, for those of you who've forgotten this myth or have never come across it, let me just remind you of the, ba the basics. So, Deeglis, a well-known um, artisan who was credited in mythology with building the Acropolis, working with his nephew, the young Perdex, became jealous of his skills and cast him from the top of the Acropolis and killed him. Uh, and in order to evade, evade punishment, he escaped to Crete, where he worked for King Minos and built the labyrinth to imprison the Minotaur. Although following Minos's daughter, Ariadne, falling in love with Theseus, he helped him kill the Minotaur. Minos was not happy, so he locked Deglas and his son Icarus in the tower. In order that they couldn't escape, Minos kept surveillance on the ports and land. Deedless recognising this, um, built wings from fe feathers of birds and, and wax and escaped from the tower. In escaping from the, the tower, he warned his son not to fly too close to the sun because the, the sun would melt the wax, or too close to the sea because the spray would dampen the wings. Either way, he would crash into the sea. Icarus initially obeyed, but, but ultimately, um, through the joys of flying, disobeyed his father, flew too close to the sun, and, and then came crashing down into the sea. He came into the sea just off the... Um, island of Icaria in, in the Icarian Sea, named after him. And anybody who's interested in know where this rock is, I can provide you the coordinates on, on another day. The, the myth has retained its popularity. To appear, it appears in art, in music, in literature, in popular culture, uh, books explaining finance and the fall of America, very pertinent, I guess. And it's also appeared in, in the theory of mental health by um, Henry Murray. It's also been used by a user group in Canada to explain that their experiences. However, Greek myths are not simply tales of adventures, gods, creatures, human endeavor, etc. And that this is the same with the myth of Icarus and Deeglas. What you find in Greek mythology are a, a series of themes that have lessons for, for mankind. This myth is no different. You can see on the on the left here, there's an old series of themes that are evident within this myth. I want to mention the first three of them now, and, and but I will return to some of the remainder as we as we go along throughout this lecture. So the first one, how we are mediocritas. This 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 emerges from sort of Aristotle's theory of, of the golden the golden mean, and and what what this suggests is it's an attempt for people to pursue a path between two extremes. So the two extremes within Icarus was a, was the sun and and the sea, and in doing so, in doing so, it's about finding. An ideal path and I do want to explore as to whether or not mental health legislation and how we currently treat the informal patient whether or not we have found this this middle path or whether or not we are still w working in extremes and it'd be useful for me to come back um, to this in terms of how mental health trusts and health boards in England and Wales are um, treating informal admission at the moment the second thing we've got here is something that's common in Greek mythology, something called peripatia. Now, peripatia is or is used to denote changes in, in for, fortunes of characters within myths. And usually those changes of fortunes are often for the worse. And again, I, I want to pursue the idea that at certain points in the history of informal ad admission, the patient's position has taken a turn for the worst. And I think we've we've reached the ultimate turn for the worst in 20, 2020, but more of that later. The third 
element I want to talk about here or theme is metamorphosis. Within Ovid's book, The Metamorphoses, the, the, the underlying theme is a, is a theme of transformation and change. And allegedly within each new iteration of, of mental health legislation, there's a, allegedly a transformation and change for the better. And within Icarus and Deedless, scholars have argued that strangely, it's one of the few myths in Ovid's book where there's no actual transformation. Some characters transform from humans to animals, etc. But that doesn't actually occur, occur within Deedless and Icarus. Some have said the fact that they take flight um, is a transformation. And others say, in actual fact, imitating flight is not the same as, as, as transforming into a bird. And again, I want to use this, this idea through mental health legislation to argue that suggestions that some legislation has transformed for the better is in actual fact a poor imitation. It's not a transformation. It's not change. It's only the imitation of it. One, um, during, during my reading around this subject, I, I came across a lot of papers, but I, I, I just had to get this, this paper in. It's one of my favourite ones that I discovered by accident. And in this paper, Char Grilled Icarus Rings, what the authors were attempting to do was determine what, how long it would actually take for the wax on Icarus's wings to melt and for him to kind of crash into the sea. And at the end of it, you can see from where this arrow is, their suggestion was between 42 and 67 minutes. And I thought it'd be fun to see whether I, I can metaphorically or figuratively um, avoid crashing into sea. So I'm going to try and keep this lecture within those confines. So we'll see whether I make it or not. Moving on then. In a year of significant events, the 1959 Mental Health Act was, was introduced. This, this piece of legislation was seen by historians as the high watermark of 60 years of reform, removing the last restraints of the 1890 Lunacy Act, a triumph of medicalism over legalism, and something that has paved the way for every piece of legislation that's followed. It was argued that it improved care, provided quicker access to hospitals, introduced community ways of working, reduced hospital admissions, etc, etc. But for the purpose of this lecture, the most significant part of it was the inclusion of Section 5, what is now Section 131 of, of, of the Act. And that is the, the, the right for people to be coming to hospital informally without having to go through a legal process. And this was not only important, allegedly, for quite a quicker access to care, but it also bestowed rights that were only um, implicit before. It made explicit the right for people to withdraw consent to treatment and the right to leave hospital without the need to ob obtain permission to do so. A more liberal approach that replaced allegedly co coercion and confinement with agency and liberty. 60 years later, it would seem that the future of the informal patient has been brought into question. The recent Wesley uh, report has suggested or reported on a steady decline of informal admission. And even though they recognize this is something that's not had, that's had little commentary about it, they almost seem to me to dismiss the significance of this with a figurative shrugging of the shoulders.
Let's try and make this a bit more real. So here we are, October 7th, 2020. 20. Throughout the U U United Kingdom, no doubt there'll be pe people experiencing some form of psychological distress. What if one or more of them decided that what would be really useful to them would be, a, would be a short stay in hospital? They know that the Act allows them to come into hospital and that is this is p the preferred option and they also know that if you don't like it the act says as informal patients they can leave what is it they'll actually find something different to that i would argue and in preparation for this talk i i, I did have some conversations with bed managers in in local trust and i was struck by what one such comment where somebody had said to me that people who come seeking informal admission are not admitted because they don't meet the criteria for admission under the Act. And I found this a really strange thing because Section 131 makes it quite clear that they, that such people do um, meet the meet those criteria. And this left me really concerned because reading around such an approach, if it's the same everywhere, and there's some suggestion it is, can have deadly consequences, literally. So there has been a number of cases where people have sought informal admission and have been turned away. And following that, they've either died by suicide or in, in one case, um, killed somebody else. And what, what, one of the cases will illustrate that well enough thinking, and this was from 2012 where Michael Knight, very much in that position, had sought informal admission. There was no bed on the day for him, but it was made clear, or two things were made clear at the inquest, is having turned him away, and then he died by suicide, the trust supported those staff saying they, they, they did the right thing, they were following the right pathway. And that pathway was, if people were not detained, then they um, would not be offered a bed. And secondly, it, w it was suggested that if he had been t detained, he would have been able to um, be been admitted to hospital, which somehow this all seems rather strange to me. So... What I want to do in the main part now is to explore how in how has this happened in this 60 year period? How did we get to this point? And it's a story. And don't worry, I'm not going to take an Icelandic saga approach, or at least I'll take an abridged Icelandic saga approach. But I want to look at how in, in the long history, how we got to this stage. But first, firstly, um, as I said already in the introduction, I want to say something on the decline of informal ad ad admission. And I know some of you like statistics. So let's have a look at the, fact that the fall of the informed patient fact, fact or fiction. So every October, we have new mental health act statistics. It's always like Christmas for me because I just love the day they come out, sad as it may seem. But the first thing we note is that the measures of detention are looked at in terms of two markers the number of people who were detained on the 31st of march and the overall number of detentions or patterns of detentions over the years so we do see here um increases in the total number of de uh, detentions we do see that more people are being detained be beforehand but all these whizzy f pictures and statistics come out that leads to talking heads representatives from charities etc talking about the increase, increase of the number of tensions what this does is the following so just like in the paintings here by Peter Brudler and by Shaw, we look at these paintings 
Yes, we look at these paintings, and what they do, they use scale and foreground to distract and misdirect our attention from, from what's going on in there. And I, I would argue this is like the Mental Health Act statistics. Because what, what we do here, we're in, for example, in Brudler's painting, we, 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 we focus on the plowman, etc., etc. And in doing so, we're distracted from Icarus in the sea here and Icarus in the sky in Shaw's painting. And what, what I suggest is this is not dissimilar to all the overwhelming numbers about detentions. It distracts us from asking questions about how many people are either admitted informally, stay informal for the duration of their stay, or become informal fo following rescinding of their sections. The effect this has, or I argue it's had, is to make or contribute to the informal patient almost becoming invisible in, in our attention. So, so that begs the question, how many informal patients are there out there? Well, one of the problems, more so in England than Wales, is that we don't report on informal admission you can see here in this statement from the um, that, that that is always included in the annual mental health act statistics is they simply say they don't report on it in other cases and here's a piece of um chart that was put out by the nhs uh, benchmarking network that shows differences in admissions and and sorry detentions and informal admissions across country is in order to get access to this data you have to pay a, f a fee to be part of the network so it's not readily available to people having said that what i do say is that perhaps the decline of the informal patient similar to mark twain's quote may have been exaggerated why do i say that well, based on best evidence, and you have to find it by doing some statistics using these documents, so please treat this with a de degree of caution. What we do see is, yes, there has been a decline in the number of informal admissions, but it would seem, if I've got these figures right, then something like 40, nearly 42% are currently of informal admissions remain informal admissions. For, formally admitted for the duration of the stay. Just something worth thinking about, folks. Similarly, Wales, who do report on informal admissions, show a significant number of people are admitted informally. Whether they stay so and for how long is, is unclear. Moving on. Before commenting or taking you through the history of the informal admission, I just want to make a, a few general comments on history and historiography to identify my bias within this. As I've noted, um, informal admission is a le legal idea. It's not appeared out of nowhere. It didn't fall from the sky. But but what I do want, want to make the point is the past events are, or what's happened in the past, is always presented, or in some cases presented as factual. There's no disputing that events did happen. But, as Alice Kessler Harris has suggested, the past is, is a movable spectacle. And what she means by this is that those factual events are constantly being reinterpreted depending on the methods that you use to construct history, the so-called historiography. And thus the received history depends on where you came from or how you interpreted it. Not rocket science, but um, important point. So to be clear, my view here is influenced by a number of things. One, um, the Alderidge's point of view that history is not linear, but it's, it's cyclical, that we repeat patterns. And I, I, I can point you towards a wonderful lecture on, on, on this that's been captured in an article, but I want to return to that. 
Similarly, the notion of Whiggism. Whiggism is the idea, or how I'm interpreting it, is the idea that anything new and shiny, it's better than what's gone before. And the crit 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 critics of this have suggested that what people do is always interpret the new from the, pers the perspective of where they are and almost reinterpret what has gone before. So there has been some revisionist challenges to mental health legislation. And again, I want to point those out. Inevitably, not surprisingly, a kind of carceral, non-carceral approach to legislation will appear. And um, a person you'll hear a lot of in this paper, so Kathleen Jones, the first known as Kay Jones, was this tension, and I should say others as well, like Clive Unsworth, is this tension be 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 between so-called medicalism and legalism. And the last thing is the rights agenda as to whether service users, informal service users' rights are addressed well or otherwise. And some of the books I've relied on in the in preparation from this, along with articles, covers some of these authors. So if anybody's interested in this area, here's a good few starters, particularly Jill P's um, collection of papers on mental health legislation, legislation, well worth a look. And so to our history. So in the so-called pre carceral period, be before people started locking them up, Aldridge has argued that unlike the, the 1959 Act that that suggests informal admission started there. She suggests that you can trace it back to 1548, where people were admitted informally, but she does make the point of informal versus voluntary, which is unclear, to Bethlehem Hospital. So that's the first point for our developing history of informal admission. Other than that, people were cared for at home or wandered the community. We then move on to the beginning of, of the carceral period, and I've broken this history down into diff different sections. So, in the pre-1849 um, period, there was concerned about how people with mental health problems were being abused and treated, and with the introduction of, in 1808, the County Asylum So-Called Win Act, not only did it attempt to address this but it, it allowed people to build asylums and a number of small institutions developed i mean it wasn't that successful because by 1845 only 16 asylums existed but the small institutions it was said to be full of therapeutic optimism based on moral treatment and not and the non-restraint movement jumping forward to 1845 and these two pieces of legislation, again, att attempted to suggest that reform was going on. And collectively, they've been labelled the Magna Carta of the Mad. Grand claim of because they, they brought forward the treatment and help, help people. However, it was also perhaps a, a beginning of a decline in a sense, because now instead of you can build asylums, um, counties were required to build asylum, asylums and asylums they built. This led to massive expansions of number and numbers, and because of that, the moral treatment gave way to gave way to orderly management and mechanical restraint. And also, there's also a note a note as this as Tute's quote here suggests of the failure of medicine to deliver and it's acknowledged as a beginning of therapeutic pessimism hence during this period because of this focus on management and restraint any ideas about developing formal admission failed to manifest hope you like my title so for the first time 1862, we have the notion for private asylums, because remember, mental health legislation, the history of, is a, hist is a class history. It's a clear distinction between the working class and middle classes and voluntary borders um, 
was something that was only the domain of those who could pay. What was interesting about this is oh, you could only become a voluntary patient, if you like, if you'd already been detained um, under mental health le legislation in, in the immediate five years. So we're, so we're beginning to see the problems of claims of metamorphosis in, in this, the idea that everything is about change and transformation and change for the better. But what we're seeing here is kind of giving with one hand and taking with others. So voluntary, uh, voluntary borders, but at the same time, restrictions are imposed on that. So nothing is developing in the way we quickly want that. A big period here now, the the so-called liberty of the subject on on the back of lots of wrongful detentions the common select committee of 1859 1877 looked in, into this i've got a little quote here i've only put this in for the effect because of again it makes me smile that the unlocking of doors was seen as positive but here we are in 2020 when when they're well and truly locked again progress folks mm, think not let's mention georgiana weldon great story this um georgiana weldon was is often portrayed as an eccentric person but is significant because of, of in 1884 she found herself in her own home where her husband had sent some medics and nursing attendants to her home to detain her to have her locked up in an asylum and what she did in the story was that she went into a kitchen while the front door was locked dressed as a nun I'm not quite sure why she kept a nun's habit there but that's another story and escaped and as a result of that she took um the medics one dr forbes and two others to court and and accuse them of wrongful detention and imprisoning her own house and she won the case now the outcome of that is that there was a moral panic among medics uh, about will they end up in court and this resulted in a certification strike i.e all the all the doctors refused to detain anybody for two years in england now can you imagine if we, if we had that now but the but the upshot of that was a commission to look at the liberty of the subject and out of that came the lunacy act of 1890 and it's the the introduction of legalism i.e where the letter of the law was seen as more important than the opinions of psychiatrists strangely um in 1889 medics was given protection against the accusations of wrongful detention under section 12 and this was this this came out of the um scottish lunacy acts from 18 eight, the 1850s and initially medics were actually in favor of the the 1890 lunacy acts but when they found out there was an intention to abolish private asylums and having got this Section 12 protection, their, their, their minds, their, their view on it changed. And why that was is that m many, many medics were receiving or being paid up to, in current figures, up to £120,000 a year. So they were making lots, lots of money out, out of um, the pri private asylums. Now, this legalistic approach, and again, or we are at mediocritas, the idea that we've not found any balance, we're kind of swinging towards ex an extreme, a pendulum, which is often used to talk about legalism and medicalism. But what we got here was some people allege was a, a, a begin of therapeutic pessimism, even, even though voluntary admission was included in this for voluntary borders and by now though they didn't have to have been detained in the five years previously commentators on this this thing are for uh, k jones k jones argued that that 
the Lunacy Act was out, out of date. And she's never been a big fan of legalism. And she, she describes it as legal formalism, overkill and vandalism. So not, not really a big fan, to say the least. Jones's main point was we don't need this legal protection anymore because by the late 1880s, all these wrongful detentions were finished and done with. However, Jones' as position can, can be challenged. So one example here, and that's the Holloway Sanatorium scandal. Now, during this time, hospitals such as Bethlehem, the Manchester Lun Lun Lunatic Hospital and Holloway Sanatorium were accounted for 62% of all volunt voluntary borders in England. And at this time, the superintendent from there, Rhys Phillips, played on the fact of anybody who's legally certified under the 1890 Act would be treated as a criminal rather than somebody who needed help. And he suggested that the, the way to overcome this was to come to Holloway Sanatorium and um, become a voluntary patient. Of course, this, this is something you had to pay for. Now, back to Jones's belief that there was no problems. A scandal broke in 1895. This was reported by Truth magazine. Now, Truth magazine was a bit of an investigative um, journal paper originally created by Henry Le Boucher. And what they exposed was, was two things. One, the death of Thomas Weir. Now, Thomas Weir, his death was that he was restrained for four days in something called dry packing, which was to wrap somebody in bandages from head to toe, only exposing their mouth and nose. And it was saying that he, during this time, he received substandard care. And this was about reducing the amount of people involved in care there in order to maximise profits. And just bear in mind at that time, uh, private asylums in today's terms, the, the amount of turnover per year was has been estimated to be, to be between 19 and 26 million pounds. So you can see why people were keen to corner the market. So death of Thomas Weir sort of cast doubt on Holloway's intentions. But secondly, it was also discovered that they use a number of practices in order to enhance retaining patients. So they would change the legal, st legal status from voluntary to detained without consent. And my favorite one among these is the story of a, a doctor who had been a patient there, who they refused to discharge and they kept him there to sign and certify other borders. Yeah. Uh, and I think before that discovered, he detained at least 25 to 50 people. Um, and once detained, their relatives had to continue to pay. This expose didn't go down well with everybody. You can see in the hospital journal, they just almost saw this as a, an anarchist, a bunch of troublemakers trying, trying, who didn't understand the problems of caring for people with, with mental health problems at the time. So Jones's argument doesn't, hold water at least in in this case with this slide i want to challenge the idea of of mental health legislation as a metamorphosis that it is in that it's truly transformational and change invoking now first of all and obviously the people weren't happy with the 1890 lunacy act and a number of things i suppose happened here so first of all it's noted significantly for introducing voluntary uh, voluntary admission and more more on that at the moment but it was seen as a move away from the legal legalistic approaches of 1890 to, to medicalism also known as welfareism that valued the opinions of medicine the rise of the medic had overcome some of those initial um suspicions 
But again, voluntary admission had its origins much earlier than 1930. So Cecil Hamsworth in 1950 introduced a private member's bill to Parliament. But because of the First World War, it never went anywhere. The border control did the same thing. Um, Morsey and London have been admitting voluntary borders for some time. But we, again, we had another moral panic. Um, the, the idea of wrongful detentions had not gone away. So a number of cases like Harnett and Bond had, had shown that the restrictions on people were still there. But the threat, and, the threat of another certification strike led to the Macmillan Commission. And out of that came, as I say, voluntary admission. The idea, but, but this giving with one hand was also the taking with others. So there was a strengthening under section 16 of the rights of voluntary patients was undermined. Um, that in order to be admitted to hospital voluntarily, you had, you had to apply in writing. And if you wanted to discharge yourself, you had to give 72 hours notice to do so. Yeah. Some people thought this was a wonderful thing. So Peter Nolan commented on, on what an uh, enlightened piece of legislation it was. But other authors, Alice Brumby in her PhD, suggested that people like Peter and other auth authors had gone a bit fanboy, fangirl about it in, in the sense that they kind of claimed it was wonderful. And Al Alice suggests that they'd taken a Whiggish approach to legislation and she draws on on the fact that despite what was said in the house of commons and house of lords about its wonderfulness this wasn't always true they took you know the lords the commons had talked to, to national level but authors or researchers like david pierce have suggested that in actual fact the 1930 act received little attention and by using the methodology that I've replicated in this study I'm going to tell you about, that looking at, looking at the implementation at a local level can give it a, a more true true picture. And now in this project I, I've been doing, I've been looking at um, the records of voluntary patients. Not always easy, because some of them with time have been eroded, problems of historical research, but thankfully not all like that. And the comments I want to make on the fact of the Third Act not being a true metamorphosis in the way it was claimed is this chart. I know it's a bit busy, but like, let me try and make it a bit clearer. So first of all, the Third Act claimed it would lead to reduced admissions. And we can clearly see with the purple line, admissions went up significantly. Secondly, it was argued that voluntary admission would reduce certification, detention. It did, but not very significantly. Thirdly, the only other point I'm going to make on this slide from Middlewood Hospital, Wadsley Simon Sheffield, is a point made by Peter Bartlett. And, and Peter suggests that any new piece of legislation can be explained in something he, he terms legislative inertia, i.e. it's very slow to catch on. So the use of voluntary admissions, the blight line you can see was very slow. And this legislation was enacted on the 1st of January 1931. It came into use. And in Sheffield for that year, there was only one voluntary admission in November of that year. So legislation can be a slow process. And we, we need to challenge almost some of these Whiggish statements about how successful it was from the beginning. And so to 1959. Obviously, I've already said something about this. But there was a no number of drivers that led to the Percy Commission who, who came together to, to review the 1930 Act. And it was argued that there was care delivery issues in asylum, shortage of beds, buildings and staffs. There'd been advances in care, day hospitals, outpatients, the unlocking of ward doors, patients going on leave. Revolutions in pharmacology, um, social, therapeutic communities and, and legislation. But also, 
there was limitations to previous le legislation. I didn't mention as another example of the lack of metamorphosis was the idea that when the 1930 Act was introduced, it's the only piece of new legislation where the previous one was never never repealed. So the 1890 Act and the 1930 Act ran in parallel right up to 1959. So you can see the you know the kinds of claims of transformation and change are not not really true. But there was a, a, a push to change, and this is where Section 5, informal admission, was reduced. Again, great that we had informal admission, but again, giving with one hand, taking with the other, again, Section 30, what we call Section 5.2 now, was introduced that put restrictions on informal patients. So the idea that they would come and go as they please, that informal admission made people receiving care for physical and mental health um, care the same was was brought forward so it's the idea of equality between between these areas but there were still restrictions and I'll, and I'll hopefully if I remember I'll come back to the fact of, about how this alleged parity between physical and mental health admissions has now been compromised so lots going on there Moving on to 1983, labelled here New Legalism. Now, people, again, like our friend um, Kay Jones, has argued what she sees as ideolog ideologies of destruction starting with, for example, with Enoch Power's Water Tower speech about the closing of asylum, Goffman, Zatz and Foucault un allegedly undermining the the structure of hospital care and she sees this as the beginning of the decline of hospital based care and maybe she has a point in terms of where we see ourselves now in the num number of reduced beds in recent years Ca against this was people like Larry Gost Gostin, he, he was a Canadian solicitor who wrote worked on behalf of Mind and was instrumental in putting forward ideas for the H3 Act. And his great thing was the ideology of entitlement. He put, he put forward a rights-based agenda that people should have rights enshrined in law. Of course, Jones criticised him, saying this was just legalism again, and. Gostin reported uh, came back with the idea if anything it was new legalism it wasn't about limiting powers of professions but giving powers to service users and one thing I do want to mention in, in this because I think it's really important as part of a document published by Mind the Great Debate Mind pushed for informally admitted patients to be given a written statement of their rights this caused real problems among psychiatrists and Jones and people like that. And I should say Jones wasn't um, a psychiatrist or medic. Because they, they said, we don't need that. It, it will compromise the work, the work of us. And I think this was a, a real mistake. And a mistake that, we, we, that kind of has played, played out with because we still not got that. And one example will suffice here. And that, and that being that without this the rights of informal patients have not had a great deal of attention that their legal rights to leave or, or withdraw consent to treatment didn't appear until the fourth iteration of the mental health act code of practice that's 2008 folks i can't believe um that it's taken so long to to get some something in there and i would argue that's limited however moving on Informal admission became section 131. Some people, like the review, the Wesley report, has argued that by pushing down informal admission to 131, rather than keeping it as the first section in the Act, which they advocate in the end of their recent review, it, it's, it's relegated informal admission. The final point I want to make here is, again, restrictions on informal patients rights of so the death of Daniel Carey he was an enrolled nurse uh, working at Tooting Beck Hospital who was killed by a patient and it's argued if, if nurses at the time were, were clearer about their powers his death could be prevented and as a result of that 
Section 5.4 was introduced um, into the Act. And for those who know me, you'll be really glad I'm not going to bang on about nurses holding power tonight. But it, it was just, again, the kind of fr alleged freeing of, of patient service users, but at the same time, kind of taking them backwards. And I would argue that taking that backwards is another example of the so-called peripatia I, I, I referred to earlier. And that takes us nicely to the review, review in 1999 under the, the Gen Geneva Richardson Committee that the Richardson's Committee actually came with some really great, great ideas. It, it, it attempted to balance entitlement and compulsion. It, it, it attempted to offer balance and more liberal liberal principles, um, but in a peripatia type moment, the government was having none of it. And I think this was fed by the ongoing moral panics from people like the death of uh, ben Silcock in London Zoo in the lion enclosure, uh, Jonathan Zito, Christopher Clunis affair. But what we ended up with was almost the, the beginning of, I would argue, almost a return to 1890 admission by detention only. So people like uh, John Fanning has recently suggested that the broader definition of mental health and, treat and treatability made it easier to detain people. Combine that with a 62% reduction in, bed in beds is come up with what I would suggest is a new period of me medicalism. Not medicalism in, in the state of welfareism, but in the sense of medics having more control over what's happening in patient's life. Almost a, com a combination of, um, I don't know, legal me medicalism. And it's heralded a new carceral period in my, my, my point of view, my viewpoint. So almost back, back, in, back, to the, back in the present, um, lots of other pieces of um, leg legislation from case law here. So there was the death of Carol Savage, kind of case brought by her daughter Anna. But, but from the informal patient's point of view, I really just want to tell you a little bit about the case of Melanie Rabone. Now, for anybody who doesn't know, Melanie Rabone was a 24-year-old person who was admitted informally to hospital and during that informal admission she was allowed to go on leave and she took her took her own life now her parents took a case out against Pennine Trust it went through all stages of the, of the court but the significant things about that well, I should say there's so many bad things about it like getting one of the psychiatrists to estimate her risk on particular days which is been un undermined by Christopher Ryan and Matthew Large in their papers with those but one of the things that came out of this was the 59 Act has suggested the parity between informal patients and people receiving care for physical disorders in terms of making it easy to get to hospital one of the judgments in this case forget which lord it was was that in actual fact People with mental health problems were, were, were considered more, more similar to somebody who was detained under the Act rather than somebody who was admitted informally for physical care. So suddenly that great push forward was now being undermined and taken backwards. And Brenda Hale in her address the British um, uh, sort of to the Royal sorry to the Royal College of Psychiatrists in 2008 was her suggestion of may, maybe her what is this what is a form of legalism as as undermined the care so this is the only time this talk you're going to hear me agreeing with Kay Jones, who I've often seen as a bit of a, a lobbyist or apologist for, for the medical profession here. But it's the beginning 
of undermining the, the, the rights of informal patients again. And I'm just going to have a look at in a moment on what, what that might mean. So, whew, 2020, where does that leave us? Well, I, yeah, it, it, I, I think we, we're going, I don't know about back to future, but we're going back, back somewhere. And I want to just explore another kind of couple of themes that comes out of Icarus. So what we have within the Icarus myth is two terms that are used, Ignarus and Nessus. And what these mean are, as it says in the brackets, it refers to unknowing, unaware, unfamiliar and ignorant. Now, within the myth, this is this is how Icarus is presented. He's asked by his father to do this, fly here, fly there, don't fly there or don't fly, fly too close to sea. But he's presented as, as somebody who is, has not really made an informed consent about his position and i think there are some parallels that have come out of the mental health act's history that the service user represented in this quote suggests that they are ignarus and nessus that they are or, or may be not being presented with sufficient information to make informed consent about whether to come in hospital and what happens to them following that. Why do I say that? Well, even though the code of practice doesn't require anybody to, as we know, providing with the information, myself and a colleague some years ago, Neil Carver, were, was interested in what are informal patients told about their rights? And in this, I'm going to tell you now, and, and the study that follows, we use Freedom of Information Act to obtain um, relevant stuff, stuff, uh, information from trusts and health boards. And, and in this first study, we asked them to supply us with any written information given to service users ab about their, their legal rights. And what we found was not good. Firstly, only something like less than half of organisations gave, gave service users any kind of information. Only six organisations made this publicly available, so people couldn't look at their options before admission. The information given was poorly designed in terms of plain English. Readability didn't meet uh, recognised standards. For example, sentences should be around 15 to 20 words. Some of them were 40 to 50. Um, certain content was absent. Some was poorly explained. For example, in a third of all, all the documents, things like what, what did voluntary admission mean? information on holding powers, locked doors, observation, etc. were absent. And a biggie here was that on, only one uh, leaflet acknowledged the involvement in service users to make it. So in terms of Ignorus and, and Nescus, then it would seem we, because there's no legal responsibility, we, we, maybe we're not telling people enough about their rights. The second study that I want to quickly mention, it's something I'm writing at the moment, is I've had a look at leave policies that uh, Mental Health Trust in England and Health Board in Wales have to look at how perhaps in a follow-up to what's happened from the Rabome case, how the legal rights of patients are now being interpreted in terms of the, the, the right to leave. And again, only just over 50%, 51% have actually got a policy that details the rights of or, or informs staff, mental health nurses, psychiatrists, uh, how leave should be managed for in, informal patients. A couple of things to mention here is, first of all, we're back to Haria Mediocritas, the idea of what is the, the actual golden mean, the, the balance between um, safety and liberty. And perhaps has uh, 
as you might expect, there is no balance. It's not been achieved. There's an imbalance towards safety. And I suppose it also brings the the theme of captivity and freedom into this. It's almost like Icarus and his father are being constantly returned to the tower. And why, why do I come to that conclusion? Well, if you read these policies, certain things come out. First thing is that we've got some organisations, either implicitly or explicitly, are actually saying or, or, or suggesting that we use de facto Section 17 leave for informal patient. And as you know, Section, sec section 17 leave is where somebody detained under mental health act requires permission from their responsible clinician to leave. But this is creeping into to policies. Second reason, some are actually quite blatantly saying manage informal patients as, as if detained. Um, a third point there, and I've got it under medicalisation leave, is the language of leave suggests um, not one of freedom but one of captivity, that it should be planned, fair enough, maybe, but it's got to be authorised, it's got to be granted. There's only, I think it was only one or two organisations who made it clear that so informal patients can't be granted leave because they're not under any st uh, statutory powers. So, but it, it's, it's creeping there. But what it also brings in here is the notions of, of the themes of obedience, disobedience, rebels and conformists. Now, and I'm aware my wings are beginning to melt in terms of time. So quickly, uh, one, one point I really want, want to mention here is that some organisations are using leave prescriptions for leave as though similar to if they were medication, but also they're getting service users to sign contracts um, saying that they'll stay on the ward, they'll only go on leave when, 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 when they... When they, when they when they've been told it can. And one, and one trust, I won't name them, even though I could, because it's freedom of information, of actually saying that if patients question the contract, they're to be told that it's a formally binding written contract and having signed it, they must con um, comply with it. Utter nonsense, complete and utter nonsense. But these practices um, are still there. And for those who rebel, who don't conform, some people are saying, well, two options, providing they don't let them go and leave, is that, they, that they're to be assessed for detention on the Act, or it should be pointed out to them, if they don't consent and agree with any restrictions placed on them, they might be discharged from the hospital. So I would argue that we're going backwards rather than forwards. So if you quickly look at this, contract prong leave as it was back in the 1950s you can see here that people are asked to sign a contract for, for what they can and cannot do when they go on leave um so this is what it looks like i suppose the amusing part of it you can probably see um if they do breach the leave that they may be banned from the asylum dancers and church services on the Sunday, but that's a, a different story. Moving on, folks. Of course, these pieces of research of mine focus on policies and not practice. They might not tell us what practitioners actually do, the researchers, there, there you go, uh, but they may give us insights in, into what organisations think they should do. And, but I would say, that if these policies do reflect practice, then informal admission doesn't take place in an enlightened space. It may have robbed service users, informal service users of their rights, and create what might be a carceral dystopia. That informal patients may be existing in in patient an inpatient archipelago as I'd man imagined by Foucault and Solzhenitsyn in which mechanisms, technologies, knowledge systems and networks, networks are designed to monitor and control the lives of, of informal patients. Before you think I've gone too far, become a therapeutic pessimist, 
out of touch with practice. Remember that impatience facilities have become defendable spaces with the uses of locked doors, CCT monitoring of patients, nurses wearing body cameras, and some units are being patrolled by security guards who some trusts, or so I've been told, are, are using occasionally to help in terms of restraint. Metaphorically then, figuratively, has the informal patient fallen into the Icarian Sea and drowned? I would say that we've not heard the splash of this yet. But maybe we should encourage it and rejoice if we do. It may be a far better position for our hero to find themselves in than the present position that I've suggested. Turning to Edward Field, Edward Field in a poem about Icarus um, Imagine that he hadn't drowned, but he'd, he'd, he'd lived. And he sees Icarus as a reduced figure. It's, his poem's not about the death of a person, but about the death of a, an ideal. And in this extract from the poem, po poem, he's making the point that rather than Icarus soaring for the skies, he's so reduced, he's making wings to try and fly to the ceiling. And maybe our hero, the informal patient, has been left in this position. And as Houlihan has noted, that any rights associated with the grand 59 introduction of the informal patient means that they're no, the patient's rights are no more than a legal fiction. And it was perhaps better if they didn't exist at all. Final lament, folks. Um... I must admit, in thinking about the decline of the informal patient, if you agree that's that, that, what that is, I've not heard. I've not heard mental health educationists, practitioners, or researchers wailing in grief at the demise. I've not seen anybody mourning, dressing in black. What, what I think, and, and I count myself in this, is that we've become like the ploughman, the shepherd and the fisherman in Brutalist Painting, that we become observers. But we might actually be turning our back on the, the decline of the informal patient. Why? Well, educationalists, they are implementing the new NMC standards that seem to be driving mental health legislation out of the curricula, any curricula that, uh, that's been implemented. Practitioners, practitioners are overseeing um, the introduction of legislation. They're overseeing and implementing trust policies, possibly. And researchers, I'm not really seeing much in, in the way of mental health researchers trying to look into this field. But that's something I'm going to leave you with to think about because time is, is, is leaving. So, I think I've told you my story. And depending on what you make of what I've said tonight, you'll either agree with me or with Garfunkel and Oates. And I've just noted that the time on this thing is run over by a couple of minutes so i think the wink the met the wax on my wings may well and truly have melted and i'm about to plunge into the icarian sea thank you and for listening thank you bye <laughs>
Before I go on to introducing Ema, let me just express my congratulations to Russell. Um, this is a well-deserved honour, Russell, and I'm sorry I can't be there to hear your uh, talk, uh, but I know that you'll be a very warm welcome to the Skellen Laureate community. I'd like to now introduce Professor Ema Muir Cochran, this year's Lifetime Achievement Awardee. Gosh, it's one year since I was there last year to receive this magnificent award. This is a wonderful evening for the mental health nursing community in the UK, as it is every year. It's a pity that we have to do it virtually this year, but circumstances require that be the case. Nevertheless, I'm sure it's going to be just as good an evening as we celebrate the very best of mental health nursing. And it's right that we do so. This year, the Lifetime Awardee uh, Laureate is Professor Ema Muir Cochran. Ema will be known to many people in the audience tonight. She's a distinguished mental health nursing academic, has been a mental health nursing practitioner, and is an active mental health nursing researcher. Ema started her mental health nurse training in the UK, as a matter of interest, uh, at the Bethlehem Royal and Maudsley Hospital a place where many people in the audience tonight will be familiar with, having worked there, uh, trained there, uh, or been involved in research there. I myself used to work at the Maudsley, and clearly it was just after Ema did her training, uh, as we never got to uh, meet each other then. Following her training, Ema then did a bit of backpacking uh, in different parts of the world, came back to the UK to work as a staff nurse, and then did a bit more backpacking and found herself working in Australia. And for the best part of her life, Ema has worked in Australia in various uh, schools. She started as a staff nurse at Hillcrest Hospital in Adelaide, then became a research nurse in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Adelaide. Following that, she became a lecturer at the University of South Australia, then a senior lecturer in the same university and an associate professor also at the University of South Australia. She then became Professor and Chair of Nursing at Flinders University where she, in Melbourne, where she has been since 2008. Ema has had a very distinguished academic career. She's garnered many awards throughout her time. For example, she was the inaugural Postgraduate Lecturer of the Year at the University of South Australia. She won the Carrick Award for Out Out Outstanding Teaching in Australia. In 2011, she was the uh, recipient of the Nursing and Midwifery Excellence Award for Research. In 2014, she had the best paper presentation at the National Nurse Education Conference in Adelaide in Australia, and also our own Mental Health Nursing Research Conference in 2018. She was given the best paper award. That conference was held in Manchester. So not only is she a very distinguished uh, academic, but she's won awards regularly. And the Lifetime Achievement Award tonight is just the culmination of a lifetime of successful endeavours, whether it be in clinical practice, whether it be in research, in leadership, as well as in teaching and learning. Now, I'm not a cricketing fan, but I do believe there is a term in cricket called an all-rounder. If that being the case, then I think Ema is a classic example of a good all-round mental health nurse with distinction in leadership, training, education, research and clinical practice. Ema has conducted research on a regular basis with numerous research awards to her name. She's also published widely and she's also presented at many conferences in Australia, in Europe and other parts of the world. So it should be no surprise when you see that her H index of 37 is pretty impressive and her, cit her citation rate equally impressive so. She has done research in collaboration with many colleagues, including many colleagues in the UK, notably her contribution to the Safe Words project that Len Bowers conducted while at City University. Ema has done research into conflict and containment, clearly. She's done research, many research uh, studies into the role of restrictive practices. She's done research into locked environments. 
alongside many other areas. What characterises Ema's academic career is regular involvement in research activity while maintaining a very high standard as a teacher and learner of mental health nursing. But Eamon is not just an excellent mental health nurse, academic, clinician and researcher. She's also a very successful person. She's a great colleague to many mental health nurses, both here in the UK and obviously in Australia. One of her distinctions is to be a visiting professor at City University, where she's worked with many people at City University on several projects. Those include Len Bowers, as I mentioned previously, uh, Professor Alan Simpson, who's now at King's College, and Professor Julia Johns, who's now at the University of Hertfordshire. I should like to offer my congratulations to Julia Johns, who was recently appointed to be a professor at the University of Hertfordshire. Well done, Julia. Alan and Julia have worked a lot with Ema. They talk about her esteem as an academic, but they also have other memories of uh, Ema as a person. Alan remembers uh, a particular occasion at the NPNR conference when he and Julia were asked to read out quotes from qualitative studies that Ema was presenting at that conference. Giving voice to the actual service users and participants at the conference in that manner was really quite moving, said Julia and Alan. Julia also recognises that uh, Ema has been an amazing female academic a great role model for female academics and a great support to female academics as she was growing up. She takes a genuine interest in them as people and she's always given great advice, sometimes bluntly, but always welcome and always required at key points in people's career. But she's also very caring and thoughtful. When she's visited City University, for example, Julia remembers her bringing a couple of books for her child Grace, which she thought was very, very helpful and thoughtful. And she talks about Grace still remembering fondly those books. Alan, of course, remembers a great colleague working in collaboration with him and a very supportive and encouraging academic to others. She would also ask how people were, Julia, Sally and all the others. She really took a genuine interest in people. And this is very impressive as well. Ema is also a great mother to her daughter Caitlin and she would often bring Caitlin on journeys to City University and others where she'd sit in the back in seminars. Perhaps another budding mental health nursing clinician, academic and researcher in the making. One can only hope so. I remember being very honoured last year when I was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by my colleagues. It is a great honour and I remember the evening very fondly. So it's a great achievement, Ema, to be awarded this, and it's thoroughly deserved. You have been an outstanding academic over many years. You have been an outstanding mental health nurse leader. You have been an outstanding researcher, and by all accounts, an outstanding person. I remember my acquaintance with you at several NPNR conferences. I remember being inspired by that technique of asking colleagues to read out the quotes from service users and participants. I remember using, after I'd seen your session, a similar technique in which I invited the mental health users to read out the quotes from a study we had done at Nottingham. It was very powerful and moving, so thank you for that tip, and I'd recommend it to others. Ema, I hope you have a wonderful evening. This award is very well deserved. It reflects an outstanding career in mental health nursing. And I bestow my congratulations on you, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I hope that the audience will appreciate that tonight's Lifetime Achievement Award, bestowed by the Journal of Psychiatric Mental Health Nursing to Professor Ema Muir Cochran, is a great mark of distinction for a wonderful academic. Everyone have a great evening, and I'm sorry I can't be there. And once again, congratulations to Russell and to Ema. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Hiya. I'm desolate I can't be with you all in person to be among so many of you that I hold in awe and respect. 
but this will have to do. I would like to acknowledge the Ghana people who are the traditional custodians of this land in southern Adelaide, Australia, from where I am presenting. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I need to thank many people who have aided my career and you all know who you are, so thank you. Particularly also all the women. Thanks UK mental health nursing sisters. Big shout out to Kat Gamble, Sheila Hardy, Karina Lavelle, Leisha Renwick, Fiona Nolan and Mary Chambers. Specifically, I also need to thank the individuals who comprise the pa panel awarding the Journal of Psychiatric Mental Health Nursing Lifetime Achievement Award and the publishers Riley. Although delighted, of course, to receive the award, I was a little concerned that I was a little bit young to receive this as a lifetime award and perhaps a mistake had been made or something more sinister. Perhaps this, this was a hint, a small poke in my rib to reflect on my career, which then, of course, during COVID, I have done in depth, leading to my decision to retire at the end of 2020. So thanks guys for raising my awareness that, oh my God, I forgot to retire early. Just remember, it's before the big birthday with an O in it. So thanks heaps, as we say in Oz, for this award. I was surprised and I'm greatly humbled. It means a great deal to me to be recognised in this way and I'm deeply touched. I hadn't actually realised how old I was until the doom of Zoom. You know, Zoom meetings, well, that doom consumed me, I tell you. And I became aware that somebody had replaced my neck with that of an ageing chicken. Bulldog clips around my nape helps little, nor did anti-ageing neck cream. And eventually, I've just turned the video off in despair. So here I am, talking to myself and to the camera. We live in very strange, discombobulating times, so my hope tonight, at least, is to make you smile or grin and reminisce about what it is that we all love about people, why we're compelled to walk towards people in emotional distress and why we are mental health nurses. I've been advised to be thought-provoking, controversial, light-hearted and humorous in this presentation, but I'm not sure if I can achieve any of that in one presentation never mind in a whole career. But bear with me nonetheless, I'll give it a shot. I've had a very blessed career. I was under the tutelage of such luminaries as Dame Jennifer Wilson Barnett when I was undertaking a Bachelor of Science Honours degree with registered nurse qualification at Chelsea College, London Uni. They were heady times in the early 80s. There she is with the perm. I was from Yorkshire, remember? And this is the kind of feminism that we had in the early 80s to the kind of sexism that we had in adverts. We went on lots of strikes in those days and Jenny Wilson Barnett told me I should spend more time in the library than in the union bar. Here I am with the necklace on in the union bar. However, three out of the four people here are now uh, professors in science in some way or another. The now Professor Dame Jessica Corner is Pro Vice-Chancellor, University of Nottingham, and I was in her group. We were about 20 of us. Ros Olstead, OBE, a Director of Nursing in Oxford, was in the year ahead. We studied books with names like Ready for Report Nurse and The Unpopular Patient by Fiona Stockwell, and we learnt about the nursing process. We studied A&P with medical students at St George's in Tooting, and I got drunk with a pharmacology lecturer. As degree nurses, we were continually told we didn't have enough clinical. We were roundly hated and picked upon. I was sent home from clinical a few times, once for not wearing a foundation garment, and another time because I had a fair bit of my head shaved. So my nurse's hat, although it was sellotaped on, kept falling off. During that time uh, at St. George's, I met a mental health nurse doing his medical placement when I was a student on Chesildon Ward, and he was wearing a Theatre of Hate t-shirt under his tunic and was humorously radical in a young one's kind of way, and I became quite interested in mental health nursing then. Not him, nursing. In later years, I really loved Jeff Brennan's short story, Just Another Poxy Shift, and thought perhaps I was that trendy nurse with DMs and red lipstick that he wrote about, all competent and fab. Alternatively, 
Maybe I was the nurse he described who used her personality as a form of contraception. It's a bit harsh, Jeff. At London Uni, the late Professor Julia Brooking was my honours supervisor and I wrote my first journal article whilst an undergraduate student. It was called The Nurse as a Change Agent. Bless me. I was all fired up about what we now call evidence-based practice. I think we just called it evidence then. It was published in the Nursing Mirror and they spelt my name wrong. I then had a chapter in the first psychiatric nursing research text in the UK, edited by Julia in 1986. Other authors included Bryn Davis, Charlie Brooker, Kevin Gurney, Ted White and Josephine Tissier. Who'd have thought? I undertook my mental health nurse training at the Maudsley and Bethlehem hospitals and was regularly told off by the uh, educator Gunnar Dietrich in group dynamics. Gunnar was very keen to get us to sit on the chairs, very upright and, as she said, on our genitals. On one occasion she informed me I was being belligerent and I naively said, what does that mean? Exactly, she said. I'd been told. I then liked group dynamics and wrote a paper about it. On another occasion, I was also on the interview panel when Ben Thomas was seeking a nurse educator position. Of course, he got the job and the rest, as they say, is history. Then I travelled around the world for a second time, as you do, fell in love, oh, married and went from clinical practice to research to the university. I've been an academic since 1991. 29 years, I believe. No wonder I'm tired. I completed a PhD um, in less than three years studying externally, something people said I couldn't do. So let me now at least try and say something slightly intelligent in this presentation. I've had both feet in education, in mental health, nursing and research for my whole career in teaching, research and clinical practice. In education, I've been an early adopter of innovative design and technology. I developed teaching materials in Second Life in 2010 with national funding, but there was a lot of resistance from staff to work in virtual reality. I've written a MOOC, a massive open online course, an app, a number of books and multimedia online resources all about mental health for nurses and other health professionals. That's been a lot of fun. I've been very proud of my research and hopefully I've made at least some modicum of contribution that's useful on seclusion, physical restraint, containment, chemical restraint and absconding, although I have strayed into other areas of research in mental health. I honestly thought research on seclusion would be redundant by the end of the 1990s with the promises of the decade of the brain and neuropharmacology. And I'm still shocked that in my last research years, I've been investigating the use of chemical restraint. And we still can't define what it is and what it is not. This is a photo of a dog toilet in Quito Airport, Ecuador, Central America. It's clean. It's uh, fresh. It's cleaned regularly with good signs for the dogs to use before they get on the plane. Now, if they can do that in Quito with a dog toilet, why are we still struggling with the kind of resources in the built environment, particularly around seclusion rooms um, and the spaces that we expect people who are very unwell and vulnerable uh, to get well in? Food for thought. The use of medication given in an emergency to control challenging behaviour is an uncomfortable fact of life in psychiatry and mental health nursing and can be deeply traumatising for consumers. As a consumer said to me about the use of restraint, use restraint with restraint. And this is sage advice. The research on restraint tends to bundle up all the different types of restraint, making it difficult to tease out research on chemical restraint, um, which I've been doing in the last couple of years with a large systematic review of all the quantitative and qualitative data. Again, something I didn't expect to be doing 24 years after I published my first paper of seclusion in 1996. Of course, I was only 10 years old then. Although I don't foresee restraint environments in acute care settings in the future, I believe it will be people power, the service user voice, social activism 
and human rights issue that will cause it to happen. The same can be said for community treatment orders, which don't seem to work very well at all. Restraint in the form of community containment and control. The landscape of care has changed dramatically, particularly in acute psychiatric settings. We now discharge people sicker than when we used to admit them. In Australia, at least, pharmacology is the main focus of inpatient treatment. Traditionally, harms in hospital care were usually associated with poor staffing or errors in medication. However, recently, aggression and violence in hospital settings has become a significant challenge to the maintenance of patient and staff safety. Reasons for violence in healthcare include the institutional effects that cause distress and frustration to consumers. Long wait times, staff shortages and overcapacity bed occupancy. Significant consumer factors include medical conditions, pain, altered cognition, being under the influence of drugs or alcohol, psychoses and dementias. Thus, providing care for people who are cognitively impaired, afraid, distressed or don't wish to be in hospital is directly associated with an increased risk in the manifestation of aggression and violence in consumers. There are deleterious effects for staff exposed to such aggression and violence. Fear of being assaulted is also like to, likely to increase the, the fact that nurses then distance themselves physically and emotionally in the care they provide and institutional responses to aggression and violence often result in the implementation of custodial measures such as locking doors and increasing containment practices. These practices in turn disempower patients and cause trauma. The issue of fear at work as a feature of clinical practice in nursing is relatively new, although my recent work in Australia has looked at nurses describing feeling safe or unsafe at work, with consumers describing the inpatient unit as a place of safety and a place where they also feel unsafe. We have a lot of work to do. Risk management strategies need to be carefully nuanced around the complex interplay of internal and external factors associated with aggression and violence rather than placing blame or sole responsibility on the aggressor. We used to have needs assessment, remember that? Now we have risk assessment. Individuals are risky to others. Risk is a modern form of stigma and discrimination. How did we get here? Current risk management cultures in Australia are very strong and rigid and have encouraged a reductionist approach to care and stifled opportunities to provide person-centred and individualised care and have thwarted some of the kinds of research I would have liked to have done. We have a lot of work to do in this space. But on a more positive note, I'm currently supervising a PhD student who is investigating ways to reduce the use of restraint in community settings used by family who don't know what else to do. And it is called passant. So the family create um, or use outhouses or structures like this to contain people, uh, usually because of exhibitions of um, challenging behaviour, behaviours of concern. They're either people with a disability, but commonly... Um, with psychosis. The free passong movement is alive and well in Indonesia, but how to minimise restraint in the community when there are little, if any, resources remains a big challenge. Such restraint is also common in countries such as Thailand, Africa and India, and thankfully is now receiving the attention it deserves. A few comments about the future, if I may. I do think it's significant to raise awareness that mental health is associated with socio-economic and political factors, particularly as we face a potentially dystopian future of pandemics, climate change, and other neoliberal induced crises, such as austerity, high unemployment, poverty, food insecurity, racism, and continuing stigma. I find my, myself perplexed as to why we still have so much stigma and discrimination about mental illness and people with mental health problems, even though it's okay now to talk about it. A little bit about media and mental health. The online world has and can affect our mental health negatively the more connected we are online. 
digital, digital technology and social media are examples of how this connection can be exactly the opposite of what we thought would liberate thinking and connect people more meaningfully, even though they're apart physically. Arguably, social media allowed positive connections in a time of COVID, but what could have been solely liberating can now be seen as a dangerous place where people can be silenced, berated, humiliated, and even canceled. Mental health nurse education needs to have an in-depth examination of these socio-political and economic factors that relate to mental health and well-being, and to understand and use social media in therapeutic ways to counter discrimination and promote well-being. Having had research and commentary published in broadsheets and tabloid press, I've never become immune to the below-the-line comments and negativity towards me as an academic in a so-called ivory tower who knows nothing about real practice. That stuff really hurts. And some were from anonymous mental health nurses. It's easy to be an armchair critic. Everyone is affected by social media, so people in our care deserve clinical staff to be particularly aware of the negative potential impact that contact with social media can do to service users, consumers, and how to help them. I'd like to say a few words about the Australian College of Mental Health Nursing Nurses and what I have done this year as the immediate uh, past president. The psychosocial ramifications of COVID-19 are almost too many to list and responding to such a thing will almost exceed the lived experience of most clinicians. Profound loss, decompensation of pre-existing illness, complex grief and a fracturing of family systems are all predictable sequelae. There can be little doubt that Australian mental health nurses constitute the most underutilised and unrecognised mental health resource for providing psychotherapy and other community care in the Australian mental health care system. There have been concerted efforts by the peak body, the Australian College of Mental Health Nurses, about credentialing, which was created by the college as a formal recognition to identify specialist mental health nurses with specific qualifications after we lost the separate register for mental health nursing across Australia over a decade ago. I was the 25th credentialed mental health nurse, of which I'm very proud. The credentialed workforce has an established evidence base of working across the breadth of stepped care stages to deliver psychotherapy, mental health care, physical health interventions. This work has often been carried out in close collaboration with other primary care providers as leaders or members of care teams. Additionally, this group of mental health nurses most frequently deliver such services to those experience, experiencing more complex mental health issues in the community setting. Credentialed mental health nurses have not yet got access to the Medicare benefits schedule to be reg recognised providers of thera therapeutic support such as psychotherapy. And the MBS in the Australian mental health system provides these rebates to which we still, as credentialed mental health nurses, do not have access. It is highly restricted in contrast to other disciplines, despite many mental health nurses being more qualified than psychologists, social workers and occupational therapists in clinical mental health practice. Hence, mental health nurses are not quite all in this together in COVID. So the struggle for this equitable access is ongoing, frustrating, and although we have sustained lobbying of state and federal governments for credential mental health nurses to have expanded access to the MBS to provide these services, we sadly to say have had limited success. There is an imperative that they are enabled to do so and the college will continue to address this and consider at the same time what the Australian College of Mental Health Nurses will look like as we go forward in these times of economic austerity and disruption. So you might be thinking about what I'm going to do in the future. Well, some of you might. Some of you might not give a rat's arse. But just in case you are concerned, I'll tell you. Well, I have things to write 
advocacy roles in mental health to pursue, um, non-clinical advocacy work I'm particularly interested in. But most of all, I believe in men sana in corpore sano, a healthy mind in a healthy body. So a lot of being out and about in nature and exercising and getting around the world. Master swimming for one. So new, new challenges. In January, which feels like a decade ago, um, I did a week-long swim trek with my daughter in the Galapagos. We were very excited about going and it would be lovely um, to be able to do that again. I'm never going to hate red-eye flights or international flights again. I'm desperate to come to the UK to see you. Some more pictures of what happens when you go snorkeling on the Barrier Reef or in the Galapagos. There's a manta ray. And these are reef sharks playing. They uh, are not predators, they're scavengers, so they're quite safe to snorkel with. And there's all, always, always, some to do in garden. So I'll be doing a fair bit of that. Or a doggo to walk. So some final words. I'd like to say to all the mental health nurses emerging and continuing, go for it. It is an amazing, fun, rewarding, challenging, maturing and often hilarious career. But don't boldly go because that's a split infinitive. Go boldly. In the, worlds of Dolly, in the words of Dolly Parton, tumble out of bed, stumble to the kitchen, make yourself a cup of ambition. It's time to raise a glass, methinks, to celebrate in advance Dr. Russell, Russell Ashmore's Skellen Lecture in 2020. And to all of you who are watching me now, I thank you for your commitment and passion for mental health nursing and for watching this indulgent. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Hi, hi Amir. That, that was a really, really good lecture. Um, thanks very much indeed. Um, it's, it's my pleasure actually to award you um, the Journal of Psychiatric Mental Health Nursing uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. Um, now, I don't actually have the award. I think um, the, the, the trophy <laughs> is with Gary and, and Gary's always telling me that things are in the post to me. So, so this one will will hit your shores very soon, okay? But um, Thank you. I think Thank you're you, Laurie. a deserved winner of this. Um, we've got three things in the journal that we're trying to achieve in, in, since I took over the journal in 2014. Um, one is the international impact of the journal and your career, actually, you, you personify that. And, and you, you, not only have you trotted glo globally across the world, you, you certainly have made an impact in at least two countries, the UK and, and Australia, um, in that respect. The second thing that we're trying to do in the journal is improve the, the, the quality of papers that are published in the journal. And you, your research is, is up there in relation to its quality. It's, it's of international importance. And um, we are very high standard. And the third thing, that we're trying to do so odd, but we are trying to make the journal more relevant to psychiatric nursing and mental health nursing. And your whole career has obviously been devoted to that. And through that, improving the lot of people who have mental health problems and use services. So as far as I'm concerned, you're ticking all of our strategy and uh, you really, really deserve this um, award. So virtually, um, I'm passing this on to you now. Um, so congratulations. Thanks so much, Laurie. Um, this means an awful lot to me. And I'm a bit worried that with all the social media going, I've got Twitter going here, I'm getting, it seems to be getting an awful lot of secondary gains um, uh, of all these positive comments. So I might have to have some serious um, counselling to bring me down to earth afterwards or get the door widened 
um, and my office at work. Um, I need to thank you, obviously, Laurie, thank you for the for the nomination. Thank you to Wiley and to the journal. Um, Patrick, thank you so much for your um, uh, introduction and to all the comments and on Twitter. And uh, just to reiterate what Russell said at the beginning of his speech, that I, th I believe I have been standing on the shoulders of giants and uh, the the history that, that Russell alluded to regarding informal um, admission to hospital, you could you could transpose that history regarding the history of mental health nursing, nurses and some of the things we might not have liked about what we were doing or why we were doing them, but the people who have um, brought us, nurtured us, role modeled us um, uh, to where, well, certainly where I am today, um, and I feel extremely humbled and privileged. Um, and I ha had to put a tiara on because uh, it, it's, well, it's now 6, 6 30 in the morning, but it was just so early and um, this is also virtual. So excuse my indulgence, but thank you very much indeed, everyone. And thank you to David for, for the technical organization that must have been stressing you out no end so thank you very much indeed okay thanks well well we'll, we'll hand you back over we'll, we'll back over to dave who um i think it's um uh, drawing a close to the proceedings tonight okay so well done thank you <laughs>